let's start. And um, also, as Rabbi Shessa said, so you know, you're welcome to put questions in the chat. And I actually tried it to to um, to check it, but I don't know that I'll be able to. So I think his disclaimer is very valuable that uh, don't assume they'll be answered. But I encourage you to put questions in as soon as you think of them. And then, I'll, and worst comes to worst, I'll get to them at the uh, I'll get to them at the end. Um, okay. So. Um, what I want to talk about tonight, I, I, I need, uh, I guess, a three-part disclaimer uh, at the outset of what I want to talk about. Um, the three, there are three reasons that this is not a shear that is intended to lead to a psak. Uh, the first is obviously Richesis is present and he's the Maradastra, so I shouldn't pass in his presence, uh, especially not for this community. Um, even though I, I don't think there's going to be much space between us at all, if any. Um, secondly. We're dealing with a question that um, greater scholars than I have already weighed in on, as we'll see, and uh, we'll continue to weigh in on. Uh, for I know that my teacher, Rabbi Mordechai Willig, is um, is going to be in a public conversation with Dr. Glott this Sunday. Uh, so I'm hesitant to uh, to put my own position out as as a uh, as a strong halachic, you know, as a psak in that in that context. And third, because this is a constantly developing position, as we'll see. And so, therefore, I don't know that anybody needs to paskin before they need to paskin. So, you know, since nobody's asked me a shayla, I don't have to, I don't have to uh, paskin it yet. So, I'm offering you what, what my thoughts are, and um, you know, and, and then we'll see where the, uh, where that goes as the situation situation develops. I thought we should address this topic because of the, uh, the you know, the broad interest in it. I actually got asked the, uh, the question in two contexts. One, a very straight question from a rabbi: Is there an obligation according to halacha to receive the COVID vaccine, and what should the triage priorities be in its distribution? Based on halacha, and a more elaborate question from a journalist uh, asking for you know what the Jewish position is. The journalist assumed that there's a priority for frontline workers, but the question is how to um, how to come next. Is it old people? Is it elementary school teachers? Do we care about the economic effect? Do we care about getting young learners back on track? Um, education, right? All those sorts of things, and what our strategy should be. So this you know this question I think obviously has a great deal of uh, public interest. I know that um, right, that Rabbi Chesis has been on the front lines of this for the shul. Uh, I see Dr. Traum has been also, I imagine many others that I'm unaware of are part of the uh, of the shul committee and um, therefore are very likely to be more up on the facts than me. So I wanna talk about the, I wanna talk about the purpose and the nature of talking about what Halach has to say about these issues. I think that's the first and um, the first part of the share that I wanna talk about uh, at, at length. Um, I need to credit first, um, there are really two two main conduits in my life for the uh, opinions of some of the great scholars of our era on the on these sorts of issues. One is Rabbi Jason Weiner uh, of Los Angeles, who's the chaplain at Cedar Sinai. Uh, so he has a very close relationship with a number of prominent, um, I would say, medical halachists. Um, and you know, we've talked about the difference between medical halacha and medical ethics. Uh, so he he wrote a question very similar to the first question that I quoted at you to. Uh, Rav Rimon, who's the rabbi of um, of Alon Shvut, and and also runs an international halacha program, and to Rav Asher Weiss, who many of you know is one of the great postgame of our time. Um, so I'm very grateful that he sent me um, he, that he he sent me the actual text of the trivial they wrote to him, and he's published parts of them on his blog. Uh, the second, Rabbi Eli Fisher, who also happens to be a summer bit midrash alum. <laughs> Um, also has a very close relationship with Ray Weiss, and he has also published on his blog, Shavot, that or on his Facebook page, Shavot, that Ray Weiss has written to two others, um, one to a doctor in England and once to Rabbi Shea Schachter uh, of Long Island. Uh, so all those are on. Are, I'll be sharing with you tonight, and I uh, should credit Rabbi Winner and Rabbi Fisher for being uh, for being those conduits in addition to their own uh, estimable scholarship. Um, Rabbi Winner uh, contributes a great deal on medical ethics um, specifically. Rabbi Fisher is um, that contributes in other areas. Um, okay, so when Rabbi Winner, Rabbi Winner published Rabbi Weiss's initial response to the question, "Is there an obligation to take the COVID vaccine?" So Rabbi Weiss's response was that he couldn't say there was an obligation. He would say he could say that people certainly had permission to take it if they wanted to, and if their doctor told them that they uh, that they should. Um, Rabbi Winner published a stronger position on his blog. Uh, so he was challenged that um, by somebody who wrote in his true verb, Weishlita was explicit and thoughtful about risk benefit of the vaccine that relies on new technology and the lack of rigor standard rigorous safety trials. How does that factor into your thinking? To which Rabbi responds, well, that relates to the issue of how strongly we would encourage people to take it. I have spoken to him again since he wrote that shuva, and he tells me that he has spoken to, to experts who have made him feel much more comfortable 
with the safety of the vaccine and the rigorousness of the trials. Um, so I think the Rabbi Weiss's position right now would be that uh, many people are obligated to take the vaccine, um, but it shows you, you know, what, what does it mean to pask in halacha on an issue which is so dependent upon factual analysis? Uh, Rabbi Weiss uh, has enormous contact with a great number of medical experts. I have contact with fewer, um, and private people have contact with their own doctors. Um, so what is the point, right? What is, what is the nature of halacha? In these types, in these types of issues, and then there was a second kind of dialogue on Rabbi Weiner's Facebook page that I thought was also valuable, in which somebody said, uh, "The hard, right, again, I'm not, I'm not quoting people by name. A hard question. If it turns out that the halachic recommendation is 99% in line with the CDC recommendation, what's the point of halacha? Right? So a, what, right? A, where does halacha get authority from? And B, if it turns out that all halacha says is follow the doctors, what's the purpose of halacha? And if it, halacha didn't say follow the doctors, why would you care about it?" Right, so it sounds like halacha is just doing me tooism. So Rabbi Wiener wrote uh, right, four different reasons. Right? One is we get to the similar conclusion in a different way, and that may have nafkaminas, may have different outcomes. Two is that there are people who will have to make these decisions on their own, such as owners of nursing homes, and they may be more influenced by what halacha has to say about it than the CDC. So it's important to say that halacha largely agrees with the CDC. Three is just to show the Torah is relevant to our times. And four is lots of people are asking for a Jewish perspective on this, so clearly they want to know. And if nothing else, it excites people to learn Torah when it is practical and relevant to the issues they are wondering about. Uh, so that's a big question for me, right? Is it really, you know, is it, how practical and relevant is it if you really think it doesn't add anything and all it does is tell you to follow the CDC? I think that's a, um, I think that's a really important um, question. Uh, so I want to put out, like, there, there is a, if I were just having an internal Lachi discussion, Within Rabbi Weiss's framework, we could say that maybe, uh, maybe even if you still believe that the vaccines were not as tested as it, that would that would make you comfortable um, giving them complete recommendations, uh, Rosh Hashanah Zalman has uh, Rosh Hashanah Zalman Arbach, is one of the late great uh, great poskim of the late twentieth century, uh, has a very wild tshuva that Rabbi Mordechai Trichiner quoted, in which he suggests that perhaps. The battle, perhaps um, dealing with a pandemic is similar to fighting a war, and the government actually has the right to order people to put themselves at risk for the good of a society. Um, right? So we could have the conversation on that level as well. Um, to me, here's here's what I think. Um, I think that there that halachic scholars are put in two very different kinds of positions, and we need to be able to distinguish those kinds of positions sharply because it leads to a lot of confusion. Uh, when we don't distinguish them. One position is when people ask them for a psak and they have to make the decision. Um, that's true of any non-expert who is given authority in any kind of community. The president of the United States is not going to be expert in all the fields that he has to make decisions about. But communities decide by, by, um, by, some, you know, by some largely democratic means, sometimes by non-democratic means, but uh, community, right, communities decide who gets to make decisions, and all important communal decisions involve a nexus of values and facts. And it's fallacious to believe that rabbis have any supernatural capacity to determine facts, or halacha for that matter. Hopefully they have expertise um, in halacha, which they don't have this, which they don't, which they generally do, don't have more than a highly competent laypersons um, education in, uh, in medicine. So, but sometimes you have to make a decision. And whenever you make a halachic decision, you have to decide both the law and the facts. Because that's what a halachic decision is, right? right? If I tell you, right, if I tell you, you, know, you ask me, am I allowed to eat this chicken that I just poured the milk over? And I say, no, that's trafe. And you say, but it's not really milk, it's soy milk. And I say, right? So I haven't paskin for you, right? Uh, right? At some point, if I'm going to paskin whether this meat is kosher or trafe, I have to decide based on the best evidence I have available, whether it's milk or soy milk. And if you ask me the question, then to some extent, I have to paskin that. So if somebody asks a question um, that depends on medical knowledge, so then if the POSIC decides to answer that question halakhically, then they have to decide the facts. And that really makes it, there's some communities and some circumstances where people might choose to give a POSIC um, the authority to answer, to answer a question like that, and somewhere it won't. So, for example, POSIC have much more real-world decision-making uh, influence in Israel than they do in the United States, um, where people ask, their, not, just their, not, the, not just the right advisory opinions about what the theoretical halacha is, but to weigh in 
on national uh, national ethics commissions, as sometimes happens in the United States on bioethics commissions. Um, but I think when somebody right in the United States, post are never given formal authority where they have that kind of responsibility. Just sometimes people give them the responsibilities. Nursing homeowners, for example, right? A from nursing homeowner might decide to ask a Shiloh, right? In what order should I vaccinate my patients? And might choose to follow that. And right, so now at that point, the post has a choice. They can say, I will decide for you, or they can say, uh, or they can say, no, I think that's a decision you have to make yourself, but that's not necessarily the right thing to do either. Um, secondly, it's it is reasonable sometimes for um for lay people to say, you know what? Um, we trust our halachic authority to guide our community in lots of other kinds of issues, which really depend on sociological judgments, psychological judgments. And so I'm not saying that this is a uh, talk, but I really care about the halachic authority's position because I assume that they have done deeper research and had access to great, a greater range of medical authority, let's say through a shul medical commission, which meets um, right, it doesn't necessarily you know, publish detailed minutes of every conversation um, than the rest of us do. And so it's very reasonable to, at that point, to say, I'm very interested in what your position would be, even if I don't frame that as a psaac. And then there's a third kind of position where you don't have any responsibility. Nobody's deferring to your practical judgment. Nobody thinks you need to make a practical judgment. All they're saying is, I want to know the way in which Torah thinks I ought to, right? Torah, Torah frames my thinking about this. So my position, um, in terms of, you know, in my private life, uh, I think that the, um, I think, you know, I, I, I'm convinced that the evidence that the vaccine is safe is, you know, is compelling. Uh, I would happily take the vaccine if it were offered to me. Uh, I have particular situations, right, in terms of family, family issues like that, but that they all militate in terms of my taking it. If someone were to ask me for my PSOC, um, if someone asked me a Shiloh, should I take it, then assuming that medical advice was in favor, I would say yes. Um, what I want to introduce, but what I want to do in this shear, though, is not to make a practical case, which I think uh, right, Dr. Traum can do for you or Dr. Chesses can do for you because they they have much more access to the data uh, than I do. What I want to do is put value framings on it. And perhaps the contribution I can make in some cases is to raise uh, to raise awareness of ways in which there are moral issues that are not obvious to everybody. Um, the most important thing I think that comes up in this in in this kind of area is the what sorts of risks are you entitled to take? All right, somebody comes along and says, I personally would rather take the risk of getting COVID than being vaccinated. All right, so what sort of decision are you making? Um, so there's one kind of issue, which is when people ask about their own care, um, right? What, what kind of risk am I allowed to take in my own care? And that, as a POSIC, I generally am very much in favor of autonomy, that people can take, people can make reasonable autonomous decisions about what sorts of risks they take in their own medical care, consistent with a general duty to take care of their health. But I don't like mechanical notions uh, that say that you have to do whatever uh, a particular doctor Tells you is the tells you is the best medical practice because you're entitled to to uh, have idiosyncratic opinions. You're entitled to care about quality of life issues. All those sorts of things I think are important. Um, what makes a vaccinate this vaccination issue specifically really uh, different morally is that it's almost impossible to assume a risk yourself without sharing that risk with lots of other people. Um, so I think that. When people ask the Shiloh, if people were to ask a Shiloh, do I have to vaccinate? The issue is, are you planning to stay in a hermetically sealed room with no contact with other human beings? And certainly no contact with other human beings who have not, or not, right, who are not perfectly transparent about and fully aware of all, right, of whatever choices you're making. That would be one kind of Shiloh, that would be about yourself. But the, um, the overwhelming, um, the, the overwhelming majority of us are in situations where all our actions create risk for others. And the kind of risk you can assume for others is very different than the kind of risk you can assume for yourself. My argument is uh, that we derive from the, um, from the halacha that you have to die rather than cause someone else's death, that the standard of risk for other people is much higher than the standard of risk for yourself. And that means, um, I think also, 
that um, you have to be much, much more um, self-conscious about the extent to which you might be manipulating facts in ways that uh, that agree with the decision you wanted to reach already, to reach previously. Um, and that's why I think you know I think that people are entitled on occasion to idiosyncratic positions, and even if that might take them to be at, uh, to take to take what are what what most doctors would tell them are inadvisable risks, but I think you have much, much less right to do that when you're talking about other people's uh, other people risk uh, risk frameworks. So that's the first point. Uh, that's the first point I want to make. Um, okay. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think that's, um, I think that there, you know, that really the, the but my job um, here where I, you know, where I am, where I am less interested in, um, in reaching a decision than in creating a framework. What I'm trying to do is create that moral, that moral framework. And so the first really important moral framework I want to say is that, it's wrong to think about it as what sorts of risks am I willing to take because I think that is a much lower standard. Um, it'll, you're entitled to take much more risk. You're entitled to follow idiosyncratic positions much more about yourself than about others. And it's really important to constantly stress that vaccination is a decision about the risk you're imposing on others as opposed to the risks you're assuming for yourself. And we'll see that that reverberates through the other kinds of um, through the other kinds of Shiloh. Okay, so Rev Ramon. Um, answering the question of how we should, how we should, um, ah, sorry, second point I want to make. Second point I want to make, uh, this to me is the foundation of all halachic uh, medical ethics, um, is that we have a principle expressed partially in that rule, you have to die before causing someone else's death, uh, but in other contexts as well, that we treat, um, we treat all human lives as equal. Um, and that you know, there are always there are always going to be um, cases around margins, uh, you know, people dying imminently, whatever it may be. But the basic rule in halacha is that all lives are equal. So, for example, the questions come up both ways, right? You know, whether uh, some people think that, let's say, people in prison should be vaccinated last because they contribute less to society than, let's say, poets or uh, engineers, whatever you happen to think is a is a is a category of great contrib contribution to society. Uh, so I think that is absolutely uh, excluded halachically. Um, that you know, any 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 choice in priorities which is framed as person X person X's life is more valuable valuable than person Y's life intrinsically is a moral abomination and should be excluded. And that means you can't talk about who's older and younger, right? We have a general consensus that extend, right that we don't care about how long the life will last. Within again with 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 arguments about on, on the margins, but certainly if you're talking about somebody who will live a year versus somebody who's going to live 30 years, you can't make that decision. Uh, you can't make the decision on halachic grounds. I think that's the second, really, right? And what people have done in the past, right? What sort of virtues they have, uh, all that is halachically irrelevant on, um, on issues like that. You might make pragmatic judgments as a community over which kind, uh, right, giving this person uh, giving this person the vaccine first is more likely to save more lives. But that's not the same thing as saying that one person's life is more valuable um, than another. Let's say there are, there, are, there are two kinds of arguments for giving uh, first responders, um, they're giving first responders uh, the vaccines first. One is that first responders are constantly in situations where they impose risk on others, not through their choice. And therefore, it is a social, it's a, a wise, pragmatic decision. More people will be saved if you give first responders the vaccina um, vaccinations than if you give artists, uh, you know, who paint in solitude 24 hours, 20, uh, 24, 24 7, will never, you know, will never come, only come in contact with a human being once when they get their mail through a slot. Um, that's a very plausible, uh, reasonable hockey argument. There's another kind of argument, which is that first responders are risking their lives and therefore they deserve to get the vaccination first. That I have a great deal of trouble with halachically. The notion that right, we evaluate worth and we evaluate worth on this narrow scale and we create a kind of reward punishment axis. Uh, I have a great deal of difficulty um, justifying that in a Torah framework. There's an intermediate category, which is that first responders are more likely to risk their lives if they know that the right that they will receive that they that they'll receive vaccination first, and that I think is already is a is a deeply um, 
I'm deeply ambivalent about that kind of argument. I think you have to make it very, you have to make it very carefully because it has it it has grave moral risks in the society. That was the second point uh, I want to make that everything has to start on the premise that all human lives are uh, are equal. Uh, if all human lives have some form of uh, infinite value, um, and that you have to be careful when you make a decision uh, that you're not um, pushing aside one life for the sake of another, right? That's the language of the mission in Oholot is en dochin nefesh ripte nefesh. You can't push aside one nefesh for the sake of another, and you have to be very careful that you're never saying that on a, right, that in terms of what I believe is its absolute value, the continuation of this life is more valuable than the, conti than the continuation of that life. Okay, that's moral principle um, number two. Okay, so Rav Rimon, in um, responding in responding to uh, Ray Wiener's question, uh, framed like the the priority question interested him was the following. Uh, right, if you have the source sheet, we're on page two now. Uh, Rav Rimon, um, and just the key is that everything in asterisk, everything in italics is me, uh, and everything else is uh, is cut from someone else. So Ramon frames it this way: um, my English translation. Assuming that the vaccine will be equally effective for everybody, right? So we're not dealing, we're going to bracket all the pragmatic questions over, right, you know, over how, how, how the vac, how vaccinations effectiveness is, is, is um, affected by, uh, right, by other kinds, other kinds of conditions, by age, um, social, right, social circumstances, all those sorts of things. Assuming that everything else is equal and you have a choice um, between vaccinating the people who are in immediate danger themselves. Right. His example is the elderly, and particularly the elderly who are in confined environments such as nursing homes, uh, or vaccinating people who are more likely to infect other, right, who themselves are not in anywhere near as, um, as great danger, but are likely to be conduits of infection to others. Young people, right, who live, right, who are, right, who for various reasons are living lives in which, which expose them, uh, which, ex which expose them to, up to, a, to a variety of others. Um, so Ramon asks, Ramon asks this question, and he says that the proper framework to think about this is chola lifanenu, all right, is who is, right, which situation is more immediate, right, more immediately ill, and he says that the, um, that the, uh, using a chazun, right, the original category chola lifanenu was developed by the Node of in the 18th century, and the chazunish in the 20th century said the person doesn't actually have to be sick, they have to write the category of a sick person immediately in front of us can be extended to a person who has a susceptibility immediately in front of us. I'm trusting him on the Chazanish. I haven't had, I haven't found the Chazanish yet. Um, and uh, right. And therefore he thinks that the right, the River Mellon suggests that the right answer is to uh, vaccinate the elderly, right, the elderly who are themselves in direct danger more than the young people who are in, um, who are, at greater, uh, have a greater chance of becoming vectors uh, because it's more immediate. So I wanna interrogate that notion of whether immediacy is the right halachic framework. And I wanna use that to, uh, to bring out what I think actually is uh, an ongoing difficulty, crisis in halacha uh, and all these sorts of issues which I think needs to be addressed and all of us need to keep asking the right questions. So the category chol lefanenu is originally developed by uh, the Dodi Behuda in response to the question of whether it was permitted to conduct autopsies um, for the sake of improving medical knowledge in a very concrete way, right? There was a particular kind of surgery that was um, in constant improvement as a result of, as a, resu as a result of autopsies. Um, and was, and there, was a, there was actually a revolution going on in medical education at the time. You can read it in a book called The Knife Man, which I have on my shelf somewhere about how John Hunter Transform medical education in England by um, right through um, through allowing allowing students to do dissection, um, and and the the challenge really was it was that, that there was no question that medical knowledge was a surgical ability was improving dramatically as a result of these autopsies. On the other hand, uh, it, very few bodies were getting buried; they were getting dug up by gangs hired by medical schools, and um, and if you said that Jews were willing to uh, we're willing. We're willing to be autopsied for the sake of medical knowledge. Then no Jews, period, would ever be buried. Um, so Nodebuta came up with a with a with a uh, with a and I would call an ad hoc solution. He demonstrates powerfully that there are no precedents, and then he says his right. The category is it depends whether there is a patient already in need of a, a, a an existing patient in your um, right in 
in, in, in front of you, right, in some way already in a patient relationship with you, who will benefit from the knowledge you will gain by, um, by engaging in this dissection. And that was his way through that, through that challenge. Um, and it's not at all clear, right? You know, it, nobody has come up with anything explicitly better or disagreeing really, I think, but it has obviously, it ran into grave difficulties. Uh, both his medical knowledge increased in all sorts of ways and anatomy lab became a standard, pra became standard practice in all medical schools and medical students don't have patients yet. So, right, so that was, so that was one way of challenging it. Also instantaneous communication around the world meant that uh, all knowledge benefited somebody somewhere in the world except in the rarest conditions. And so there have been many efforts, such as the Chazanish, to extend the to extend the Nodi But the, the, the problem Nodi Bihuda had was if you say that you're allowed to violate a prohibition to gain knowledge because it will generally improve medical care. So he didn't understand, he didn't see where you could draw a line. Uh, and he writes in his Triva, he says, if if you call this pikuach nefesh, right, you say that adding to medical knowledge generally counts, right, because there's a patient somewhere in the world who will eventually benefit from this, counts as pikuach nefesh, so then not only doctors work on Shabbos, but anybody working anywhere in the healthcare industry can, right, can work on Shabbos. Cancer researchers should always work on Shabbos. People manufacturing bandages should always work on Shabbos. And every, right, every, everything you do right, that contributes in any way to improving care anywhere down the line. So he drew a very, a very stark line. Right? I'm going to read you what the Nebuchadnezzar you know, said. He says, um, If you say that conducting autopsies, which we admit will gain knowledge that will improve medical care, counts as pikuach nefesh, why do you bother having the conversation? It's an explicit law, right, that pikuach nefesh pushes aside everything in the world, and not just pikuach nefesh, but even suffix pikuach nefesh, right? Not, not, right, even when there's, a, when there's a remote chance that you'll save a life, and not only immediately on this Shabbos, but even in future Shabbos. right? So if, that, so if that were the case, he said, um, right, everything would become permitted. So he ended up saying that actually there's just a bright line. If there's a if there's a patient in front of you, then it's pikuach nefesh, and you can violate everything in the Torah, right? Except for murder, uh, idolatry, and, and adultery. Um, but if there's no patient in front of you, he said you can't even violate dirabanans, right? That's his line. It says, um, in our case, im ein shum If there is no sick person currently um, who needs this, just they want to learn this wisdom. Ulai is the main choleshi yetsaraklaze. Maybe a sick person will come along and eat this. Vadai lo dachina mishum chashasha kalazu shum iser Torah o afilu iser derabanan. We don't push aside for this for this light concern any biblical prohibition, not even a rabbinic prohibition. Shema tak karei lo chashasha zu safek nefashot. Because if you call this concern safek nefashot, imkani ye kol melechet harufod. Then all medical pract all medical professions right grinding the medications and right and and um, Cooking the medications and preparing and right, sharpening the knife, right, to bleed people, all those will be permitted on Shabbat. Shema is the hayom right? Because anything you do might become necessary. So this is a straitjacket that uh, halacha has been in, which Poskim have spent 200 years. It's, it was it was a brilliant at the time, I think, a very valuable uh, straitjacket. But Poskim have been trying to figure a way around it for 200 years because that bright line is very hard to sustain intuitively. We understand the challenge, right? And I, I can say, I'll tell you, I got Shilas about whether people could go to work uh, early, in the, uh, early in the pandemic period. Um, let's say, uh, you know, people, I got Shilas about whether people could sew masks on Shabbos. Uh, I got Shilas whether people could go to work in government offices that were, um, right, that were um, preparing uh, right, that that were you know that were engaged in trying to uh, to maximize um, and and maximize the efficiency of distribution of PPEs, uh, right? Those sorts of questions, and some of them were some of them I thought you could be at some things, and some of them I thought not, uh, and it was very challenging because you know to be, you know because you don't really think that it should be everything is permitted or nothing, and yet that's the framework that Nodi uh, gave us. So we'll see how that plays out in some of the halachic questions that. Uh, come up with us, right? Is there, right? So, every, um, so Ramon said that was the right standard, 
Uh, and I'm not sure that was the right standard, even in the Nota Bihuda categories, uh, because that assumes that the person you're focusing on is the person in front of you. But actually, when you're talking about vaccination, you're not, right? You never, the, the person, the people you care about really are not the people in front of you, right? There's always much more risk to the other people around you, right? Just, right? If you get sick, then you might infect lots of other people and they might be more susceptible than you. So the notion that we prioritize the people who are, nobody's sick, right? We're, all, we're only talking about preventive measures, right? The whole point of vaccination is nobody's sick yet. So I wonder whether it's not a category error to even try and introduce the notion of immediacy as opposed to thinking about long-term social prospects as well. So my instinct um, would be not to use Rev. Ramon's um, categorization at all. Uh, Rev. Ramon said, and I, I'm the same issue that, you know, that he's writing in this, under the pressure of circumstances, and I, I don't know if, on reflection, uh, if on reflection that would be the right um, that would be the right framework to use. Um, but the right what Ramon's doing um, is trying to say like, the way to think about this is pikuach nefesh. It's a pikuach nefesh situation, and because of pikuach nefesh situation, then we have to figure out how to prioritize it. But what you know, if you accept my claim that. Cholo Lefaneni was the wrong category. The implicit notion of that is that it doesn't fit into the Nodi Behudas category at all. It's not re it's really not Pikuach Nefesh at all. Um, and for many people, you know, it's really, it's really, it's worth thinking about like what the standard of Pikuach Nefesh individually would be. Um, you can test that, but you know, right, you, know, you know, in certain ways, like test is uh, if you had your, right, if you had, a, you know, a very important social engagement, and you could get the vaccine at three o'clock in the afternoon or at nine o'clock in the afternoon, right? When would you get it? And if the answer is I would put it off six hours, so then probably it, you know, probably you can't violate Shabbos for it. And if you can't violate Shabbos for it, then it's not probably not because of Nefesh. So some people would and some people wouldn't. And that probably has something to do. You know, I think that there are, uh, and why they would and why they would not is also, also matters. I'm, I wanna interrogate that notion of whether Pico Nefesh is the right category. And I wanna do that with you through um, Rav Asher Weiss. Uh, so Rav Asher Weiss wrote a, um, wrote a tshuva um, to a doctor in, um, in England. Uh, seems like Alicia Khan Cohen, I don't know how to pronounce that name. Um, and here's the question he was asked. I'm translating English, you can follow along in Hebrew. He says, right, so now, right, so now that, right, here's my short answer to your question. Now that they've begun to, um, to vaccinate people in your country, England, and in, in, a, in the beginning, they're only vaccinating people. They, they had adopted the approach of Ramon suggested. They're only vaccinating people who have, uh, what do they call it, comor, 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 comorbidities, whatever it is, conditions that raise their level of risk. Each pe person is invited to take their turn to reach the, right, to go to the local clinic in order to receive the vaccine. Um, and since there's a limited, there's a, there's a limited quantity of vaccine to distribute, if you don't show up in the first in the first round, you're going to be pushed off to the second round, and nobody knows how long that will be. So right, so there right, so in England where they have a national medical right, national medical insurance right, single payer. So right, there's just appointments. Everyone has an appointment, and you get your appointment on Shabbos. And you don't have the option of of exchanging your appointment with somebody else. Right? We could try and say you try and set up situations, bulletin boards, things like that, where you exchange appointments. I don't know if that's practical or not. The assumption is that's not practical, and the Question is, are they allowed to be Michal Shabbos to receive their, vac their vaccination as opposed to being pushed off to whenever the next round is, which nobody knows. Probably will be fairly close, but nobody knows. Uh, right, he says, right, okay, nobody knows when this will be. But we can assume that it's not going to be very long because nobody's interested in punishing people who don't show up because right, our goal is to get everybody vaccinated. So, right, so can you be Michal Shabbos? In order to receive the in order to receive the vaccine now, as opposed to waiting for the next round of vaccine, right? This is elderly people, all right, or other people at high risk, um, right? So his answer, right? So his answer is, this those pshitolan. It's obvious to me. Uh, it's obvious to me that I cannot permit any kind of biblical prohibition for the sake of receiving the vaccination, um, right? He says, I don't think I can even permit a rabbinic prohibition, because even though the right, the, the uh, pandemic is is uh, govera, right, is increasing increasing its force in your location, it's very difficult to categorize receiving a vaccine as pikuach nefesh or even as suffix pikuach nefesh, 
uh, which would let you push aside anything because you know what? If people, his claim is, if people observe proper, uh, proper cautions, it's really unlikely they'll get sick. And it's particularly unlikely that Dafka, those people who don't get vaccinated now, um, right, are going to get sick because they'll get vaccinated soon anyway. However, he says, you know, you're talking, right, since it's in a local clinic, everybody can walk there. So there's nothing wrong with walking there. And you're getting a shot into a muscle. It doesn't require, right, it's not even a psych ratio. It's not even inevitable that that's going to cause blood. So there's no, right, there's no even risk of any kind of even quasi biblical violation. Um, the only issue, the only issue is that there's going to be a non Jew there, uh, right, a presumptive non Jew there who's going to, uh, right, who's going to write, write down that you received your vaccination, and that's really for the government's sake and not for your sake. And therefore, he says, you know what, I think you can go get the vaccination on Shabbos because I don't have, I don't see any reason, um, I don't see any reason, I, I don't see any real violation that you're committing. So you can see what he's doing, right? What he says is, I can't call it Bikoch Nefesh because I call it Bikoch Nefesh, I don't know what the boundary is, but you asked me a specific question, and I'm going to give you an answer that lets you do what I think the right thing is uh, without setting any kind of precedent that goes, um, that goes beyond that. Uh, well, the interesting question thing is that um, a different question was sent to him by Rabbi Shei Shachter. And, his, right, the, and, his, and Rabbi Shachter, the, um, the, right, the question is as follows. Um, right, this is page five of the... Uh, of the question, right? Is there is there is a doctor, right? a, a woman, a, a woman, a woman doctor, and she has been panicking the whole time about the risk of infection to her and her family, and she's waiting desperately for the uh, for the vaccine so that she'll no longer be at risk of um, of of contagion, and um, and it seems li likely. That what's going to happen is that each you know each hosp each hospital staff whatever it may be they're going to get a they're going to get a time in which um, right in which they can receive the shots but because right and if they don't get their shot at the time they show up they're going to be pushed off to the next round which is going to be several weeks later. Now in the United States it's unlikely the clinic you don't have local clinics with a centralized process giving it out so it's probably going to be that the hospital you work at gives you the option of being of being vaccinated. And the hospital you work at is not going to be in walking distance. So the question is, can this doctor on Long Island, uh, on, can this doctor on Long Island go in on Shabbos to receive, all right, to receive her, um, her vaccine shot as opposed to getting it several weeks later in the next round? So here's what he says. I've already answered this question in England about elderly people and sick people, right, and people with, with other kinds of illnesses that increase their, increase their vulnerability. Um, and they also were worried that they'd have to wait a certain amount of time if they didn't get the vaccine. And he says again, I can't allow violating a biblical prohibition because it's really hard to see accepting the vaccine as pikoch nefesh that pushes aside Shabbos. After all, right, this doctor has done her work for, for many months and hasn't gotten and hasn't it hasn't become infected. And as long as you behave in a responsible manner, then it's not so likely she's going to get infected. And even though in Bikoch Nefesh we don't follow the rove, and even though even when there's multiple sfekot, right, multiple multiple improbabilities, we generally uh, violate Shabbat for Bikoch Nefesh, it's still hard to call to figure out what the boundaries of that are, and it can't be infinite. I already explained that not that it's not true that any slight faint doubt uh, can risk allows kill of Shabbos. Okay, so now it sounds like she can't go. But then he says an astounding thing. He says, Ach mikoma kom, we're on page six now, near it, but nonetheless it seems, It seems like this isn't, shouldn't be any less than a sick person who's not in danger, uh, but does have an illness on Shabbat, where we allowed them to not only to benefit from the from the independent work of an Andrew, but we allow them to ask an Andrew to do something, uh, right? But what didn't right? So if if a, if a sick per, if a person a sick person who's not in danger can tell an Andrew to do something, so he says, "You're put. You're in a statistical group that um, right that has a certain amount of um, that a, where the group." is subject to a statistical risk. 
And that, he says, is enough to make you a, the equivalent of a sick person who has right, an unendangered sick person, and that we allow you to violate rabbinic prohibitions, especially asking a non-Jew to do something, and therefore he tells the doctor, you can get in an Uber and drive to the hospital on Shabbos to get your shot. That's an amazing thing, because we read the Nodib Yehuda, and there is no such intermediate category as, right, as sort of pikuach nefesh, and so he says what I think is astounding creativity. Yeah, but this sort of pikoch nefesh counts just like sickness, which isn't pikoch nefesh. Um, that to me is an amazing thing. Uh, I find it very hard to accept it analytically, um, and yet I think that it's um, I think that it's the right. I think that it's the right answer. Um, but I don't. But I'm dissatisfied with the reasoning. So. Um, I mean, Aaron Fraser on Rabbi Wiener's Facebook page. Aaron Fraser, though, some of you don't know, is a Boston, Boston native. He was the, also the JLIC at Brandeis. Wonderful, uh, wonderful Talmud Chacham. So he asked, this might be a reasonable way to think about the issue for individuals. But is it the right way to think about the issue for a society? The issue for a society is that a certain, more people will die if we don't vaccinate as many people as possible, as rapidly as possible. And so the question is not so much whether you should go to your appointment on Shabbos. The question is whether in Israel, if they're following halakha, should they be giving vaccinations 24-7? Because right, even though the individual risks may be hard to view as pikuach nefesh, but there's no doubt that on a communal level, there is right there are lives being saved by engaging in this. Um, and it might be that Rabbi Fraser sets out like a plausible test. If we believe, right, if in fact we are making every effort to maximize vaccination as rapidly as possible, um, right, now it might be that going to a seven day a week model has other costs that we're not willing to engage in terms of quality of care because we're taking medical professionals away from other areas, we're exhausting them, but assuming that we could keep everything similar. If this is the, right, if it's a communal, need to get as many people vaccinated uh, as rapidly as possible. So maybe that's the right way to think about it in the same way that you think about uh, right that, you know, that that soldiers or policemen in Israel aren't supposed to think about whether their individual task on this Shabbos is preventing an attack on the country. The country needs there to be an army and a police force on Shabbos. Um, and then I think right um, Deborah made the same point uh, in conversation with me. Um, right, and that if um, right, we wouldn't, if that were the case, you know, nobody would suggest that um, that doctors shouldn't show up. It's that's you know, the same issue as doctors being on call generally, uh, right? When right, where we participate in a society, and so if the society determines that it needs this to happen all the time, and right, and there's no way to arrange a switch, so then you're allowed to show up because that's your contribution to society. Um, that's const- that counts as pikuach nefesh. Uh, so I think that's the right question that we need to really be thinking about. Um, I think right, Fraser's question is right. I think Deborah's question is right. That it might be that it's not the right way to think about it, and the right way to think about it for everybody. The moral question, as we went back to, is not to what degree is this bikuach nefesh for me, or even to what degree is this bikuach nefesh for a for a specific set of other people. Now, this also has real challenges. You know, what happens if there are, you know, if my failure to vaccinate um, creates a one in a million chance that one person in the United States will uh, right will die will die of covid who wouldn't have otherwise so something nefesh right it's hard right that's i think Ray Weiss's challenge is real there has to be a boundary um, but at the same time i think that a society can look at the situation and say that from our perspective there's a very high probability that more people will die not because of your choice but because your cho- but because of what would happen if your choice were universalized it would happen if everybody acted the way you did. So I think that might very well be the, a much better way to think about it. And we need to um, think about halacha much more in those terms. I don't know that you have to go um, as you know as far as uh, Rabbi Arbach did and say actually you know dealing with a pandemic is the equivalent of going to war. And so you know, in a sense we suspend normal halachic rules uh, in certain ways, and we were bound by much broader canons of ethics. Um, but I think that that kind of calculation, that the the calculation, um, I usually quote an article from Rabbi Mordechai Tendler about this, that 
communities are allowed to think uh, about statistical people and not just about real people. Individuals have to make decisions in terms of real specific people. The communities are allowed to make decisions about statistical people. So I think that's really the right, the right framework, which we maybe have not gotten to so much yet in the public discourse, is thinking about right, everyone's responsibility in the context of a society when our goal is herd immunity. Uh, right? So you don't think about what your decision will do. You have to be thinking about what would happen if everyone made the same decision you did. Um, and I think that would lead us to a um, to allowing, right, assuming that in fact, now I don't I don't know what how the vaccine rollout is being made. If it turns out that you know, and I had another Shiloh about this recently, you know, whether what happens if right, what happens if you're working in a clinic that just sets its hours as nine to five, and they're perfectly happy nine to five five days a week. So from five o'clock Friday to nine a.m. Sunday, there's no medical care in that clinic at all. Um, but they're small clinics, so they can't allow you to. They can't, right? So they're not going to. They're not going to allow you out of uh, out of rotation. So they won't give you off Friday afternoon. Can you go into work? And I thought the answer was no. Right? It's not pico nefesh, right? Because they could. They, it's arbitrary. They could move the hours to seven to three um, on Fridays, right? Or six to two, or they could extend the hours the other days of the week. No, you know, that's their decision, and you're not participating in a social decision that it has to happen that way. Uh, but if we were in a situation where we really felt that it was absolutely imperative to vaccinate everybody as rapidly as possible, uh, then I think that would be, um, and I think even if we're not in that, you know, it's not a time issue, but it's an overall question that, uh, you know, if you say, for example, in terms of herd immunity, that really nothing matters until you get to a certain percentage, right, that the effectiveness of it is dramatic. There's a tipping point at which it's, it's, it suddenly becomes massively effective. And until then, every dis in the individual decisions don't make so much difference. So then to say that halakha is going to be decided based on what the impact of your decision is, is not correct. The right way to decide halakha is, right, will we reach the, the degree of communal, of communal vaccination that enables us to end the pandemic or not? And that depends on your decision. It depends on your decision and those of everyone else. And unless you all make the same decision, we're in trouble. So I think that that perspective uh, needs to be introduced much more into, um, into halakha. Okay, I wanted to... Um, talk about uh, one more Shaila in the um, in the same context. Uh, it was really, you know, uh, my uh, my friend Rabbi Dov Linzer and um, also Rabbi Susker Katz, um, who I apologize I can't cite because I haven't had a chance to read his trivia yet, um, except you know, except in in his brief citation of it in a comment on Rabbi Linzer, uh, addressed the question of whether you make a bracha when you get vaccinated. Um, and particularly the question that they asked, right? You could ask the question, do you make a bracha at all? Uh, right? But they, uh, they framed the question as which bracha do you make? Do you make, do you make a hagomel? Do you make a shechianu? Or do you make a uh, hatov hametiv? Um, and so a big part of it right, was Rabbi Sari Linzer in, in, initially said that he thought you should make hatov hametiv and not hagomel because he didn't think that essentially, right, you can look at it, right, and see whether I'm calculating, but essentially it was having the same problem as Rabbi Weiss. Do we really think that you have been in pikuach nefesh? Um, and the answer is, no, probably not. Um, so he, Rabbi Linzer writes as an addendum that after, after he wrote this, that he heard from many uh, people like the person asking the question that Rashachter forwarded, where he's right, that, that uh, medical personnel really felt that they had, right, that Vaccination would be a moment of a moment of freedom. Uh, so religious said, you know, that he, he also that the reason he also seemed to, to push against Hagomel is that he has a he, he believes in very narrow categories of, uh, of of Hagomel as opposed to any risk you've been in. Although he acknowledges that that's not necessarily the best outlook. So here I want to make one other point, which I think is really uh, is really very crucial and relates to all the things Ray Weiss said as well. And I think that. It's a reframing that would that would I think yield um, a, a different halachic discussion, and I think perhaps a more productive one. Rabbi Weiss makes the claim continually that the basis of his psak is that if you engage in proper precautions, you're not likely to um, you're not likely to uh, right to get ill yourself. I don't know that he's right about that in terms of medical professionals, but I think that that's a factual claim. Is that I'm not it's not my job to make that. I think it's a I think that. It's uh, it's a somewhat questionable practical claim. All right, I'll leave it at the, I'll leave I'll leave it at that. But that's not really the the issue for 
for, me, for those of us who are not medical professionals, it's a right, it, the real question is not is not we 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 could avoid pikuach nefesh on the whole by staying home, uh, right? By only right, which you know, in large measure, my family has done, right? We stay, right, we stay home absolutely. We don't stay in contact with anybody who hasn't, right? We're not, we're not in contact with anybody who hasn't positively quarantined themselves and gotten the positive test. We have all our groceries delivered, um, right? Right, you know, right. We try to do everything we can to avoid any kind of contact. Um, so really, what's going on in, um, in the question of priorities of vaccination is not so much. There's a group of people, or here's the way I would frame it. There's a group of people who have no choice. Society gives them no choice, but to put themselves in positions that risk themselves and others constantly. Of which there's, you know, the medical professionals are the obvious, uh, of the obvious case like that, but other people like that. Um, people, right, clerks in grocery stores, Uber drivers, right, right, all sorts of people who have no choice um, right, we've decided social right that they are essential services, and at the same right, and those in providing those essential services, they put themselves and others at risk. So I think those are the people who need to be prioritized, because they don't because the, for them there's no choice about being. That's what I think is the right category of whole. If on anyone is, if there were one, they're the people who have no choice but to be in situations where they risk themselves and others. Then for most of the rest of us, and in varying degrees depending on our economic circumstances. On our other responsibilities, uh, what we're really making, we're really talking about is, do we get to live something resembling a normal life? All right. In order to live something resembling, right? To the, we have to be vaccinated in order to live something resembling a normal life. Otherwise, we have to be hermits. Uh, and that, I think, is really the way the question needs to be uh, needs to be framed. And I guess we also need to know that every time that any person's choice not to vaccinate is really sentencing. Not just they're not just putting other people at risk, unless they agree to hermetically isolate themselves, they're forcing everybody else who is at risk into hermetically sealed chambers. Right? I can't go out because somebody else who has not vaccinated might be walking down this, might be jogging down the street um, right next to me. So I think that's really that the the framework we need to be thinking about is understanding the costs, not individually, but the costs socially to so many other people. If we don't reach the uh, right, a sufficient point to enable a normal life to resume for so many of us, and when we think about prioritization, which is the opening question, so I think that the proper axis for prioritization uh, are right are the, are the first thing we do is we vaccinate the people who have no choice but to put themselves and others at risk. And there I say they're all there are categories of the people who do that professionally. Uh, it might be that there are patients in there are people in confined areas. Nursing home patients, prisoners, who right, who don't have the option of avoiding contact with others because they're they they're either cared or supervised by lots of others people whose behavior they don't control. I think that has to be the prioritization. And then after that, we have to talk. We we should be talking about the way in which we can um, free the most people in the most significant way to resume a life that looks something like you know what we thought was normal um, nine months ago. Uh, and I think that that that's the right axis uh, that we should be thinking about uh, in terms of figuring out vaccine um, prioritization. I think that can be rooted um, well in um, well in halacha in two ways. Right, we've talked about you know, equivalence of lives, talked about the priority of avoiding risk to others as opposed to risk to yourself. And the last thing which we we didn't do in the context of this year uh, is talking about the value halacha gives to living a normal life. Um, right, I think that will be the and that'll be the third. Okay, that's the end of what I have to say. And um, so now I would, you know, I, I guess I, I, I'll be frank, I'd be very disappointed if there were no questions at all. Uh, right, I, you know, I'll look at the chat, right? And it's entirely correct, right? That, you know, that this analysis is not unique to, um, is not unique to COVID. Uh, it applies to measles and mumps as well. But I don't want to talk about, you know, but in different ways, um, I don't want to, I don't, you know, so I don't want to, Distract myself because I, the truth is I'm not up enough on the numbers and and the way in which it spreads in other diseases. So I don't um, if I don't I don't want to move on to that. The principles are the same. Okay, so uh, I'm hopeful that there are questions and challenges. If it incentivizes you, I intend to um, to write this as a response to the rabbi who asked me. Right, so I'd like to make sure that I haven't said anything obviously wrong um, before I before I write it up. So please challenge me. 
Um, Rick Clapper, I've got a question about um, those who are struggling with mental health um, issues right now. There's a very large population in that category. Um, and I, I don't think it's just about their right to a normal life, uh, but their capacity to gain um, you know, re-socialization um, is critical for their uh, emotional well-being. How, how would that, you know, would, how would we categorize, um, let's say somebody who's at risk of self-harm because of their isolation? Um, you know, is that, is that what, what tier or what priority would that get? Um, they're not providing a critical service, you know, by being a grocery clerk, but um, the more time that they spend in their harmful routines, the harder it will be for them to recover. Um, so, how do you like? How do you think of that uh, population? So that's a right. That's a, that's a great question. I actually got a a, a practical question, uh, very you know, very similar to that um, last week. Uh, you know, people talking about like you know whether you know, what do you do, right? If maintaining the strictest level of restrictions actually puts you at grave risk of you know lack of uh, right of of harming your mental health. Um, so my answer to that would be, uh, you know, first of all, right, this is a general move that you know that we don't we can't view self harm as a wrong moral choice that you can be punished for, but right, right, we view that as a symptom of mental illness on the whole. I mean, lack of mental health, I would say, right? illness is, I think, is not might not be the right category. And so the simplest answer is, you know, that's immediate pikuach nefesh, right? If that's if if you're talking about if you're talking about actual right actual risk of right, actual risk of self harm, that's usually not the case. The more likely circumstance is that what will happen is that such people will end up breaking the rules. In order, right? In order to find some social, some social circumstance. So I think that you know that you know that when that is something that is you know extraordinarily hard to overcome, which I you know where you you know that you view those people as also in situations where they have no choice really, but to put themselves and others at risk, right? The risk to them may come in, right? They have a choice of putting themselves at risk by not right by not going out or by putting others at risk by going out. And so again, because I, I want to be clear, right, as we talked, I don't think that grocery workers, right, who would get priority because they're doing a societal good, right? I think they would get priority because they have no choice but to be in a situation which risks themselves and others. So people who, because of mental health difficulties, will also have no choice but to put themselves or others at risk are, I think, in the same, are, I think, in the same category. Now, how you administratively do that, you know, do, right, you know, do we, Right, that's a whole that's a whole challenge, right? You know, what what sort of doctors know those are administrative challenges. But on a moral level, I think that's the basic framework, right? Is you know that if there's no possibility and right, and we can't view it as a moral failing, that you won't be able to put yourself in, that you you'll be able to avoid putting yourself in a situation which will endanger yourself or others. So then you need to go up above those of us who make that choice, however painful it is for us. I agree. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I'm glad. I can always play out, you know, play out theoretical frameworks. Uh, but you know, I guess unless you all attack me, right? So then, you know, probably I'll stick to it. So this is a really good chance to influence me. Um, right, Cooper. Uh, hey, Harry. Good hi. To see you. you too. <laughs> I, I, so going back to Rabbi Tess's question. Uh, so, or, or actually, the way you framed it, the people who um, who are having, you know. Uh, uh, Difficulties, uh, uh, but they're not act at actual risk of self harm. Could we classify those people possibly as Kolosh um, Ein or maybe would there be a stronger case for that? Um, I don't. I don't know that Kolosh Ein is the right category. I think the, to me the real thing is that they're going to put other people in Sakana probably. Now, if you tell me what, all that's gonna, what's going to happen is that the, you know you know what these people will do. Right, they'll stay home, but it will mean that you know that that it will take that you know that there'll be traumas that will live with them for for a while, but short of self harm. So yeah, that's then they're cholosh and basakana. That's that's right. That's entirely right. And a cholosh and basakana probably goes ahead of people who aren't cholim at all. Right, I think that's probably right. But I think in many of these cases, um, it's much more likely 
that what's going to happen is that they're going to start cutting corners uh, about safety th safety things, and so it's probably it's probably more in the category of creating create, creating whatever that category of communal risk is. The wife seems to assimilate that the whole chain bus kind of, and I'm not sure that's the right framework. I'm not convinced. Uh, but again, I'm only reading Ray Weiss. I'm, you know, very likely if I had the privilege of speaking with him, I would all of a sudden be convinced. Who knows? Okay, thanks. All you right. Know, the, the question of risk is, is the quantification of risk is such a challenge because, you know, people say, well, uh, it's only the elderly who are going to die if this happens. So first of all, if we're saying that death is the only number that matters, that's, in my opinion, deplorable. But um, you know, you say that well, your your risk of death if you're 80 and you get COVID is about 20 percent. So that means you have an 80 percent chance of survival. You may not want to survive after you get that. I mean, as as again, as unpleasant as that sounds, that and if you're 70, I think your mortality rate is about 10 percent. Again, that's a 90 percent chance of survival, but a 10 percent mortality from an infection is, you know, in a statistical framework, unacceptable. And if you extend that to the survivors of, which is again most people, there are there are longer there are long-term sequelae that we are learning more about, and there are, uh, and so, it, but you get into this discussion with some people about, you know, well, it's it's not that bad because of A, B, and C. And it's, it's, and it's to some degree, it's a question of, you know, how people assess risk and how people define such numbers in a way that is, um, again, in my opinion, not really acceptable to discuss in a communal framework. So I'll try to start responding to that, then you can tell me, right? Cause I don't, I don't think we disagree at all. And I think that the, um... Yeah, I don't I, agree with anything you said, by the way, either. I'm not. I'm not saying it's a disagree. Right. So, right. So, I'm going to try. It. I think you know the last sentence you said. Right. The last phrase you said was really right. Was really valuable. Right. You said in a communal framework. Right. That these are. Right. I think that's really the big issue that needs to because if you look at it and you say, okay, you have a 0.05 chance. I don't know. What's I don't know. Right now you have like a. I guess in many places like a four percent chance of getting sick over an extended period of time. You might have a ten percent chance of getting COVID. Whatever, fifteen percent chance depending on how cautious you are. And then you have an X survival rate, um, right? So that's that's where we we put our picolach nefesh category. And then you have the risk of long term complications. And we're gonna have to figure out what sorts of long term complications, right? Are are cholish and sakana, which what which ones we would classify as cholish yesh sakana, even though they don't necessarily lead. Right? We'd have all those kind of messes um, conceptually if we were doing that I you know and then we have the then we have the very different situation communally which is that we know that X number of people are going to die if people don't do this right it's not because even though we need because there's because there are 300 million people in the United States right and and right and then I think the, the again the more complicating factor is that you can't isolate the effect of each person because right because there's a right because what 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 effect your decision makes really depends on how other people make it, make decisions, right? And the effects multiply at some points. So I think that I think you're right that on a communal level we need to consider long-term disability, um, right? And those sorts, right? Those sorts of issues much more, uh, much more seriously. On a communal level, you need to think about the long-term social costs of if it's really true, right? That let large numbers that we're going to be massively increasing inequality in certain ways because, right? Because because the education of 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 um, right of people of lower income people is going to be affected much more dramatically than of higher income people. We need to think about whether our capacity to provide for medical research is going to be diminished because we have put ourselves we have spent enormous amounts of money without producing right without producing any goods the equivalent rates right? so we've created this massive debt right all of, right whether you, you know, or you can say some economists think not right but that's it I think all those sorts of issues as a um, a community is entitled to make those decisions and. When, right, and post can have to be very careful about what you're saying. You know, well, I'm making whether I'm making this decision because the only sphere of influence I have is this. But I should recognize that if I were in a bigger sphere, I would have to make you know, I have to think, I'd have to think in a much broader scale, and therefore say in those circumstances, you know what? Even though this might be the answer I would give to you if you came to me as a private person and the government had said nothing, 
but the government made the decision this way, and now we have to function with that as a moral reality, right? That right that that there are big communal issues that are affected. So I think all those issues are right. Um, I think it's one of the big challenges for postgame is trying to figure out right what the right what the right for Torah right, for, right that, I think that's why I quoted Rabbi Wiener is a really valuable thing right you know why are we answering this well uh, right we're answering it because maybe there are a few detailed differences um, but either there are detailed differences will anybody be able to act on them well maybe nursing home owners will be able to act on them and anyway people want it to be relevant so I think we have to I think that's a real point we need to say that right Torah, Torah would have something to say we need to say we, there are things in which we should say that we want Torah to be part of the general moral conversation of the United States uh, I remember right uh, Michael Broyd published a tribute to Magdalia Schwartz in the Jewish press this week I think in which he talked about Rabbi Schwartz's contribution to the stem cell discussion where he was very very careful about right to frame it right you know this is this is what I think is our responsibility as Torah scholars in terms of affecting the American moral debate, which we believe will affect the political decisions, right? So I think that's a way in which halacha contributes, right? We, right, you know, we contribute to the moral discourse, and there are lots of decisions being made, and we create an environment in which those decisions are likely to be made better. I hope, uh, right? Just by the public conversation, right? Sometimes specifically, you engage, right? You know, you do ethics consults or you serve on commissions and things like that. Um, I think have to, the post can be very careful. We all have to be very careful about saying, like, this is what Torah would do if we were just a small group of people and we were making individual decisions. This is what Torah says to do in this context, assuming that there has not been a political decision um, that right, that's determinative. And this is what we say when there has been a political decision. And therefore, you know what everyone else is doing. And right, and so how you, right, and so how you react has to take into account all the other decisions that have been made. And also that, you know, let's say the, that, I don't think it would be a good idea for a POSIC to say the government did this because the government believes that, uh, right, that we are at risk of a depression if we don't, right, if we don't do this and that will cause many people to die, right, of all, right, of, of, you know, because we won't be able to provide medical care. And for a POSIC will get up and say, well, no, you know what, I read this economist and this economist convinces me that actually there's no risk to death at all. So, right, so how can you make a decision that way? You have to go back, right? You have to make the decision in term, you know, without, without taking economic considerations into account at all, right? I think that would be a serious error for a, right, for a POSIC to say that halacha exists independent of the political system that way. So we're going to determine, right, what the economic out, outcome of various decisions are. I think that we belong to a political society and, and the political society's judgment on what will happen is something that we have to work with, as, right? And, and we participate as democratic citizens in, determ right, in determining how much what we think the economic risks are. But once that's a, that determination has been made, you know, by a democratic society, the job of POSIC is to accept that and work within it, and you know, work within it um, within those facts morally, as opposed to, you know, to reach you know, to reach your own set of facts. I don't think that would be constructive. Is that helpful? All right, thank you for the question. Um, okay, anyone else? Well, thank you so much, Rabbi Clapper, for teaching and providing this conceptual framework for prioritization. Um, wish everyone a uh, wonderful night of Zos Chanukah and a good Arab Shabbos. Thank you, Rachel. Please thank feel you. free to email me or, uh, you know, I guess it's a little hard to sit on the chair outside my porch right now, uh, but if you have <laughs> snow pants, <laughs> that, would, that would be fine too. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Thanks very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you.